is a snapshot of the breadth of the church. Most of us, we only get to live in one place at one time, so our experience of the church is quite limited. But as we read through these letters to the churches, we see something of what the church is like and what it has been like through the centuries and across the world. But more than that, what it does as well as you read them is it tells us what Jesus thinks of them. It tells us the good, the bad and the ugly of the church. And that got me thinking, how do we evaluate a church? How do we evaluate a church? I mean, for schools, we have the dreaded Ofsted, don't we? Whatever you think of them. Well, imagine there was an Ofsted for churches. We could call it, this was my best MS Paint mocking of the Ofsted um, logo, Ofsic. We could call it Ofsic, couldn't we? The Office for Standards in Churches. And imagine you work for Ofsic. That's your job day in, day out. And your job is to go to churches. It is to inspect them, to see what they're like, to write a report um, and to publish it. How are you going to form your opinion on these churches that you go and visit? Who do you ask? What are you going to, what are you going to look for in the churches? Where would Smyrna, the church in our passage today, fit? Would it be outstanding? Would it be good? Would it be requiring improvement? Or would it even be inadequate? I have a, a slight fear, if you like, that actually there would be a risk that for many that Smyrna, maybe for us, would end up stuck in something like the requires improvement category. And that's because we sometimes, I think, instinctively use the wrong measures. Imagine you were going to go and visit Smyrna, and before you went, you wanted to collect some information. You wanted to speak to people in the area to see what they thought and to find out what was going on. Um, and imagine this was some of the information you got back as you wrote your report. This is what could end up getting written. Could get, this could get written. Smyrna is a church with very few resources and is on the edge of society. Its members are largely considered out of step with both the culture around and the better established meetings of God's people in the area who are all well respected and offer much more to the local community. Complaints are regularly received about their teaching and practice, including behavior which is seen as at best immoral and damaging and increasingly may be considered illegal. Their presence and witness is damaging to the reputation of God's people more widely and to the wider mission of the church. They offer little that we can see to their members, no building, no courses, no children's or youth work. I'm embellishing it slightly, but isn't that the gist as you read Revelation of verses 9 and 10? Isn't that the gist of what seems to be happening and seems to be said at Smyrna? Smyrna wouldn't, this is a picture of Smyrna, obviously today, not then. Smyrna wouldn't have looked or sounded particularly successful. When we evaluate church, when we're looking for maybe a church to go to, we look at all sorts of things, don't we? We look at the kind of building they have, what building, if they have a building. We think about what people say about them, how attractive they seem to be as a church when you walk through the door, what image they project. We think about whether they're growing. We think about what they offer, what do they have that will work for us, that may help us, where we can get involved in. And as we do that, is there an underlying sense that if a church is well spoken of, if it's growing, if lots of positive things seem to be happening, there's groups, there's courses, then we kind of assume it's a sign of God's blessing that his hand is with them. But Jesus, he looks at Smyrna differently, doesn't he? In Smyrna, there were no real signs of external flourishing and outward flourishing. There were a church that was spoken badly of not just by those outside of God's people, but actually those who would have been considered God's people. Well, complaints, allegations, lies, destroying their reputation. They'd have been said to be on the wrong side of history. They'd have been said to be standing against what both God's people and the wider society wanted, and not standing against it in a way that engendered awe and respect. 
you at these few verses, this little letter to Smyrna is unusual in Revelation because something is missing as Jesus addresses them. Something is missing. I don't know if you noticed it. It's this. There is no complaint about the church from Jesus at all. There is no complaint. Most of these letters in Revelation have some form of complaint. Something that when Jesus looks at the church, he sees and he wants them to change or address. Whether in what they listen to, what they teach or what they do. But for Smyrna, Jesus has no complaint. It doesn't mean they were perfect necessarily. But perhaps it does mean on Jesus' report, they would get an outstanding. Because he sees differently and he uses different measures. Smyrna, they were in a time of darkness. Jesus, he looks at this little church and he sees that they are in a time of real darkness. He looks and he sees their tribulation. He knows their poverty. He knows their struggle. He knows the lies that are being spoken against them. Jesus knows and he understands. And he doesn't see it as a sign of some kind of fault with them. He sees it as an attack. An attack by those who are allied against Jesus and his people. He sees it as coming from those who he says are from a synagogue, a gathering of Satan. From those who claim even to be God's people but are not. He sees it as an attack from those who have allied themselves with the culture around to try and crush Jesus' church and his people. And Jesus, he knows and he understands what that is like. Because their experience is, isn't it, it's a mirror of his It's the mirror of the experience that Jesus himself went through. He was slandered by those who called themselves God's people. Those who called themselves God's people turned a city against him and they used the power of the state to oppress and ultimately crucify him. Jesus knows and he understands the darkness. And he knows that the opposition and the persecution, it isn't a sign of weakness or failure or lack. But actually, in some ways, it is a sign of their strength and their faithfulness. They are rich, despite what it looks like on the surface. But Jesus also knows, as well as being a time of darkness, that it was also a time that was going to get darker still. If you look across time and the world, there are times for the church, aren't there, of light, of flourishing, of growth, where God's word and his people, they, they change cultures. They bring good. The church visibly grows. And there are also times of growing darkness where that same faithfulness brings opposition and persecution. In reality, here in the UK, we're probably somewhere like late summer, maybe the start of autumn. Here we have a more subtle opposition that at any, more than anything else is really felt rather than enforced. It's at the level of employment and things, if you like, rather than true freedom. But Smyrna here, they were well past that. And Jesus knew that for a short time, things were going to get even worse. Look at verse 10. Do not fear what you're about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and for ten days you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. The devil wants to put an end to the church in Smyrna. Not because they look spectacular and special, not because they are flourishing, but because despite the opposition, they are still being faithful. The darkness, it tests us. It tests the church. What will we do when the opposition intensifies? It's true of individuals, isn't it? You only really know, I think, sometimes what someone's character is like. Whether they believe what they say and the words that come out of their mouths when life gets more difficult, when the pressure is on, when they suddenly don't get their own way and life doesn't go as they wanted. 
Let me tell you a well-known story. It is a well-known story, but it illustrates it so well. In 1871, there was something known as the Great Chicago Fire, which we never learn about because it happens a long way away. But think Great Fire of London. The Great Chicago Fire, it killed around 300 people. It destroyed 17,000 buildings and left about 100,000 people homeless. There was a man at that time, and this is where it gets famous, called Horatio Spafford. And he found himself completely financially ruined in the Great Fire of Chicago. All his finances and his wealth were tied up in the buildings that he owned in the city. And he was financially ruined. But more than that, in the fire, as well as all his wealth, his four-year-old son was killed in the blaze. But his and his wife's faith were strong. In the darkness of those days, they trusted God. In fact, two years later, they decided to go on a journey to England. They decided to set sail for England to help with an evangelistic campaign of then a famous evangelist called Moody. Spafford, those two years later, was busy actually trying to rebuild Chicago. Involved in that work, so his wife and his children, those remained, went on ahead of him. And the boat and, uh, that his wife and four daughters were traveling on crashed into another vessel and sank. A few days later, he received a telegram from his wife that simply said, survived alone. The darkness of the Chicago fire, which had taken his four-year-old son, had become darker still. A few days later, he traveled by the same kind of route to head over England to meet his then grieving wife on her own. And as he passed near the spot where his family's ship had collided and where his children had died, he wrote the, sin that we, the hymn that we now sing, It Is Well With My Soul. And we're going to sing it a little later. But as he sailed past that spot where the darkness had become darker still, these were the words he wrote. And, here you, and as you hear them, listen for the echoes of Revelation. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to know, it is well, it is well with my soul. Though Satan should buffet, though trial should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded my helpless estate and hath shed his own blood for my soul. What is true of us individually is true of churches too. As the darkness closes in on a church, will they hold fast to Jesus? Will they pass the test? When the persecution of the church in Smyrna turns violent and physical, will they in that moment, will they cling on to Jesus? As our brothers and sisters around the world face increasing opposition and persecution, will they cling to Jesus? And at a much, much lower level, will the church here in England, facing relatively mild opposition and dislike, will we cling to Jesus? But what will help us? What does this passage say will help us in the growing darkness? Well, these verses, they tell us what Jesus thinks will help us. And two things, we need to know who Jesus is if we're going to cling on. And we need to hear his words to us. So who is Jesus? Well, the introduction to each church in Revelation, to who is writing it to them, isn't chosen at random. But it's part of the, the picture of the risen Jesus that he wants that church to know for that circumstance. It's specific to their need. So look at verse 8. And this tells us what of Jesus do his churches need to be reminded of in times of trial and persecution? And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, the words of the first and the last who died and came to life. Jesus was the one who conquered death. In times of darkness and persecution, we need to be reminded that Jesus was the one who conquered death. But the Christians in Smyrna and very, very many other Christians around the world, persecution that leads to death is a very real prospect. A 
And Jesus wants them to know that they are following the one who has died and who has conquered death. For most of us, when, for most of us, when we stop and think about it, death is a pretty scary prospect. It's why we largely shuffle it to the side of life and try and ignore it. And while I think you can become a bit immune to the process of death and funerals when they're kind of out there or in a work capacity, the prospect of our own deaths or those close to us and those we love is always a bit scary. There is, isn't there, for those who've experienced it, a certain deep sadness that comes over you in those moments when you watch a close family member or a friend pass from life to death. It's an experience that never leaves you. And in some ways that's right, isn't it? Death is the ultimate symbol of our rejection of God and our rebellion against him. It's the final sign, if you like, of his judgment. It is not supposed to be good. But here, for those facing their possible deaths, Jesus comes and he reminds them, I have been there. I have experienced that pain and that separation. And I have come to life on the other side of it. Jesus reminds them that he has defeated death and he has found life on the other side and there is now nothing that can hurt him. There is a certain hope, the far side of death for the Christian, despite the uncertainty, despite the fear, despite the sadness. Hope of a new life, a life with Jesus, a life where even the final judgment of God on this world cannot hurt them. For those facing persecution, where the world wants rid of them and them gone. They need to hear that if they cling to Jesus, they have a life that nobody can take away from them. That's who Jesus is for the persecuted church. And what does Jesus say? The Christians in Smyrna, they didn't just need to know who Jesus was and who was speaking to them, but they also needed to hear his words. And in this letter, I don't even notice there are only two things really that Jesus tells the church to do. Do not fear and be faithful. Do not fear. Verse 10, do not fear what you're about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested, and for 10 days you'll have tribulation. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. Do not fear. I can say this as reverently as I can. There's a part of me that kind of pulls, pulls against the instruction not to fear. I mean, Jesus says on one hand, the devil is going to come and rip you apart as a church, throwing some of you into prison. The sense is that others will die. You've been on the edge and the periphery of society for a while now, and that's been hard enough, and it's going to get worse. Do not fear sounds a bit like asking the impossible, doesn't it? Do not fear. But Jesus, he doesn't ask the impossible. Think for a moment about the things that you fear. What worries you? What keeps you up at night? What do you see or fear that is on the horizon? Is it possible to not fear those things? Sometimes we think that fear is a kind of deep emotional response to something that might happen in the future that we have no control over, that just kind of comes out of it. I can't help fearing. For the Christians in the persecuted church, the threat isn't abstract or distant, but very real and very present. But yet Jesus seems to think it's possible for us not to fear. That in some way we can get to that place. And here fear and trust seem to be set in a kind of opposition to each other. Do they fear what the people can do to them? Or do they trust what Jesus has done for them? As Jesus sets this up, it's an encouragement. It's an encouragement. Jesus knows that it is, in some sense, is frightening. That's why he says it. But it's an encouragement and instruction to not to fear, but to trust him instead. It's an encouragement because he's reminded them of who he is and why they don't need to fear. And it's an instruction. Trust me. Trust me. 
which is the second thing, isn't it, they're told to do. Be faithful unto death. Do not fear, but instead be faithful. Jesus' words here, they remind me of the apostles in Acts 5, if you know that story. They, in, in Acts 5, the apostles, they've been going around Jerusalem, uh, preaching and teaching about Jesus, and they've been called before the very same kind of council that in the end drove Jesus himself to Pilate and to his execution. They've been called before people, powerful people, who tell them in that moment, in no uncertain terms, to stop doing what they are doing. The apostles then, they had every reason, didn't they, to be afraid, every reason to back down, every reason to just give a little bit, maybe to take their teaching and their preaching out of the public eye, out of the temple to the sides. But in Acts 5, the apostles, with every reason to fear, instead trust Jesus and are faithful. This is what they say in verses 29 of Acts 5. And they're saying it to the, to the council. But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and saviour to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to these things. And so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. And after they'd then been given a beating for what they said, what did they do? Because they went away rejoicing that they'd been counted worthy to suffer for Jesus. And they didn't stop teaching and preaching about Jesus right in the middle of the public eye. Do not fear but be faithful. What does this mean for our brothers and sisters elsewhere in the world for whom this is a very real situation? The church in Smyrna, it was in a dark place. It was facing ever-increasing opposition and persecution, and that is the very real experience of many churches around the world today. If our experience now is the back end of summer, theirs is the depth of winter. And you know, sometimes as you read about it, it can be difficult to know what to pray and how to think about it. I often find it hard. But I think these words from Jesus can help us know how to think about it and how to pray, how we can encourage other churches who are facing extreme persecution for their faith. There are two just quick things. I think it means that firstly we should have an especially generous spirit towards them. In five of the other churches in Revelation, Jesus has something that needs addressing, a complaint that he has to make. Here that is conspicuous by its absence. Smyrna, I don't think, were perfect. But in the face of significant persecution, there are more important things to say. In the face of persecution, the church needs encouragement to stand firm, to be faithful to Jesus and to not fear. When it comes to the persecuted church today, let's have the same generosity of spirit. Their circumstances matter. Here in the UK, we can rightly point out where the church has turned from God's word, from his teaching, and call it to repentance, like the other letters in Revelation do. Because there's really very little reason here in the UK at the moment to turn from Jesus and his ways. The repercussions are relatively small. But when we look outwards to the persecuted church and the rest of the world, let's have eyes that try and see and understand the depth of the opposition that they face. Let's try and have a Christ-like generosity of spirit towards them. The second thing I think we can do is we can try and encourage them towards Christ. You know, in our prayers, in our letters, if you have ways to something like open doors or contacts to write and to speak, let's encourage them towards Jesus. And especially the fact that he is the one who has died and come to life. Especially the fact that he is the one that will one day give them the crown of life. That he is the one who sees, who knows, who understands. Sometimes we feel helpless, don't we, when we look out. How can we change anything? Practically, politically, we may be able to do absolutely nothing but we can do something of more significance than either of those things because we can pray for our brothers and sisters that they will not fear and they will cling to Jesus. 
what about for us here? For us who do face some opposition, even is compared to little. Even in the face of less opposition. Or perhaps when we're facing a different kind of struggle. A struggle maybe in the workplace, which is becoming increasingly common, where compromise from what you know to be true and believe is encouraged. Or perhaps where you simply look ahead in life and you just see the, the challenge that might be around the corner, the difficulty or the pressure that might land on your doorstep. Well, these words of Jesus speak to us in those moments too. And I think if we practice living them out now, when the opposition is limited, when we potentially face greater tests in the future, we'll be in a much better place. Sometimes it can be tempting, can't it, to put the bigger challenges in their own box. You know, as if not fearing and faithfulness are something that needed at the far end of opposition. But we prepare ourselves for that by doing it now, by putting it to practice now in the smaller things, so we're better equipped when and if we end up facing harder tests. So do not fear, but be faithful. Whatever challenge we face, whatever level that is at, that is the call, isn't it? Not fear, but to be faithful. To trust Jesus over what our minds and our bodies are perhaps telling us. To trust that he is the one who has been through whatever we go through. He knows what opposition is like. He knows what pressure is like. He knows what human weakness is like. He knows what abandonment, loss, and even death is like. It's not easy. But when opposition comes, we need to focus our eyes more and more on our Saviour, the one who loved us, who died for us, who gave us new life, and he stands waiting to welcome us home. Let me finish with that second verse that I read out earlier and from the song we'll sing in a moment. And then Richard is going to come and lead us in our prayers. But listen to these words once more. Though Satan should buffet, though trials should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded my helpless estate and hath shed his own blood for my soul. Amen.